We are in a series called Colorful Kingdom, and that's where we're going to go next with our time this morning. For the last two weeks, we've addressed some basic questions uh, that you would probably expect to find on any invitation. If you received an invitation in the mail for a wedding or a party or something like that, you would want to know what is it, when is it, how do I get there? And so we have been asking these basic questions the last two weeks related to the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Who's invited to come into the kingdom of God? And if I'm interested, how do I get in? We began by sort of sharing this long definition of the kingdom of God, which I I will come back to later. But for now, I'll just say the kingdom of God is his rule and reign in our lives. It's his influence. And it starts with just the reality that God is reigning. It is a reality, but it is by God's design meant to be realized in our lives. And that realization of his influence and presence is what we're calling color in this series. God made us, in the words of Jesus, for abundant life. This picture of of a, of a cup or a bowl or something overflowing. Not just, hey, I've got a little bit and I'm getting by, but flourishing. That's what Jesus wants and that's what his presence brings. Um, Paul in Romans 14 describes the kingdom of God as the experience of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You may hear those words, especially if you're newer to church, those words may not sound all too familiar or maybe even attractive to you. You're like, that's like churchy language. But if you strip back the churchiness, this is what everybody wants. All right, I want righteousness, which is another way of saying right relationship. I want to be right with the people in my life. I want peace. I don't want to be constantly in turmoil, wondering whether or not I am enough or I've done enough. I want joy, which is deep, lasting fulfillment. Who wants that? Right? That's what Paul says is the kingdom of God. That's what God brings into our lives when we surrender to his influence. Another one of these pictures of the kingdom and the color that I love is Colossians chapter 1. It says we have been delivered from the domain of darkness. If you want to get scientific, no color, right? And transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son, full color. So hopefully you're getting the point. This is what we were made for. And it strikes me that multiple times Jesus, when he references the kingdom coming, The kingdom has come. The kingdom is here. This is God's kingdom. It is always when he is casting out a demon or he is healing a disease or he is forgiving sins, setting people free to live as God made them to live. That's the kingdom. God's, I would say, progressively growing influence in our lives. And last week, we saw the parable that Jesus told about the wedding feast, which is a picture of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like, Jesus says many times in the New Testament. And then he finishes that sentence in different ways. But last week, the kingdom of God is like a wedding feast. This experience with the tastes and the experiences that none of us would ever want to miss out on. The good news, speaking of this invitation, is we don't have to miss out. Nobody has to miss out. We are all invited to come to Jesus, to believe in him, and that is how we enter. And that's so important to say that it is not by trying to be a better person, trying to stop certain behaviors, coming to church, giving to charity, all of the things that somebody else might look at you and say, oh yeah, you're, you're there. God says none of that stuff will get you into his kingdom. It is by believing in Jesus and being born again. Which again is language that some of you may be like, what? And that's what, as we saw last week, Nicodemus was like, what? How do I go back in the womb and come out again? And that's not the point. It's the spiritual rebirth. It's God resurrecting what is dead in us because of sin. What cannot ever inherit eternal life. He says, I want to bring you back to life. That part of you that died because of rebelling against God, I'm going to bring it back. That's how we enter the kingdom is by believing in Jesus. And coming to him, and so that leads now to this week, where we are going to drill into this a little bit more in the sense that this is not a destination that we arrive at, right? Like, I I responded to the invitation, I'm in, and now I just wait to die, and then I one day go to heaven. There's that, there's that feeling sometimes that, that it's a transaction. God paid for my sins so that I don't have to go to hell. That's the Christian life for many people, I would say. But rather, it is, it is the beginning of a relationship. It's, it's the beginning of a journey with our creator. And I would just say, how many of you are in a relationship? Put your hand up. Any relationship. Hopefully, you have a relationship, okay? Um, let me ask... 
as you reflect on one of those relationships, how many of you know 100% everything about the other person? Eh, maybe, like, you're sitting there like, well, I, I know a lot, you know, I know more than I used to know. I don't know that any of us could say I know 100%. Because by God's design, relationship is a continual process of discovery. And that's what God made us for. I think it's already been said from the stage. It's, we were made for relationship with God, and that takes time, and there's always more to it that we don't understand and we don't know. And so life in the kingdom we're going to talk about today is not about arriving at all of the answers and being able to quote the scriptures and impress people, but being curious, not having answers, being able to ask good questions and say, I don't know. Well, let's go on a journey together. That's why Jesus, when he called his disciples, didn't download a bunch of theology. He said, come, follow me. (laughs) We're going to see some things together, and then we're going to talk about those things. That is the Christian life. That's what we're going to talk about today. So we've shown this picture several times um, to illustrate the colorful kingdom, and I was just combing through looking for images, and this one jumped out at me as this picture of, and these were some words that you shared, joy and peace. And those two words specifically communicate the idea of rest. I could just sit and watch this. And yet you also shared some words, and this didn't occur to me till this last week, like wonder and adventure, which is sort of the opposite of sitting and looking. It's like, but, but what do the flowers smell like? But what's over that ridge back there? What would it feel like to walk through that field for myself? See, that's the secret that we're going to look at today of the kingdom is not, hey, I've arrived, I'm in, what now? It's what else? What else? I'm asking questions. Really, I think the best way to summarize it is the heart of a child, which Jesus references several times. It's like, I'm ready to go. Lead me. We're going to talk about that today. But with that introduction, would you turn in your Bible, a Bible, to Mark chapter 4? And if you don't have a Bible, those Bibles in the seat backs are for you to use or keep. And I was so grateful. I had a conversation with a lady after the first service today, and she was holding one of those Bibles. And she's like, I'm going to steal this. And I was like, you don't have to steal it. You can have it. And I said it. You can take it. Um, as our gift to you, just to have that Bible, I really do think, and I don't know, we all learn differently, but for me, have, having been able to hear it and see it, and maybe if you want to write notes, I learn better when I'm engaged on multiple levels. Uh, In this chapter, there are three different parables where Jesus says the kingdom is like. We are just going to look at the first of these three this morning. Um, Before we read, would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you that you're with us and you, you know our hearts. You know the things that no one else knows. You know the, the disappointments. Um, you know the joys, the dreams. Uh, the challenges that we face where we feel like, I don't know that there's a way past this point. But you also bring the life and the hope and the acknowledgement and affirmation of our value in your, in your presence. Um, that you made us in your image and we're precious to you. Thank you, Jesus, that, that whatever the messages our culture are, are sending us, whatever we're listening to that's telling us otherwise, would you just shut those off for a minute so we can hear the voice of our Father who loves us and approves of us. Lord, lead us in this journey of discovery, not that we would ever say, oh yeah, I've already heard that, but that we'd say, what else, Lord? Lead me and speak to us through your word, we pray in your name, amen. So I'm just gonna share uh, the first 10 or so verses of this, which is a story. Chapter four, verse one says, again, he, Jesus, began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered around him. He's got kind of a following at this point in Mark. So that he got into a boat and uh, sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. That might feel weird. um, But as you may have experienced, that's a really good sort of acoustical arrangement. If you're on the edge and you hear somebody out on the lake and you can sometimes hear everything they're saying. There's a reason for that. Um, I also, though, think the religious leaders... We're probably like, why are you teaching when you're not in the synagogue? I think Jesus broke a lot of those norms. But here he is, he's in the the boat, and there's this huge crowd on the land, and he said it was teaching him many things in parables. I didn't take any time last week to point out parables are like a story, but they're more than a story. It's an earthly uh, example or illustration, but it's always intended to communicate a spiritual truth. So as we hear this, you're, you're hopefully listening for that. He's teaching, and in his teaching, he said to them, verse 3, 
Listen, behold, a farmer went out to sow seed. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Then in verse 9, he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now it's obvious just from that last line, there's more to what Jesus is saying than just a story about seed and farming, which would have been very familiar language to them. There's some deeper truth being communicated, and I was trying to think of a modern-day equivalent of this, and I thought maybe a sermon illustration, but a sermon illustration, you state the truth, and then you tell a story. A parable, you just tell the story. And then where does that leave people? (laughs) All over the place. Uh, You've got some people who are like, wow, kind of random, but cool story. Maybe I'll tell it to my kids tonight, you know? Uh, maybe other people were like, I think Jesus is telling me I need to be a better farmer. Like I've been sowing my seed in the wrong place. You know, I need to go avoid the rocks or something like that tomorrow morning. I'm sure there's probably people who thought Jesus was crazy. Who is this guy telling stories to adults? Um, but then there were those who were like, ears to hear what? What, what are you actually saying? What are you really talking about? And maybe they were curious enough to even come to Jesus after the crowd had dispersed and say, Jesus, what is this about? Well, that's exactly what happens in the next verse. Verse 10, and when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. So notice, everyone had left. It was, he was alone. It was, it was done. Moment was over. But then everyone with the 12. So notice it's not just the 12 disciples, which I sometimes picture as like the special chosen hallowed few with like maybe a little glow following them around. Um, It's just anyone in that crowd that was like, I feel like I might have missed something in that story. I think there's something deeper. They, it says, came to Jesus and listen to what Jesus said. He said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for everything, for, for um, those outside, everything is in parables, so that, quote, they may indeed see but not perceive, may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Um, this verse has always bothered me since I was a kid, because it sounds like, at least at first glance, Jesus is intentionally trying to obscure the truth from certain people in the crowd. Uh, Imagine if my goal or one of my goals on a Sunday morning teaching or preaching was to have just some of you get what I was saying and the rest of you went home confused. Would that be a good approach? No, it would not be. So we need to understand a couple things. First of all, who Jesus is talking to here, not just some random people. He's talking to the Jews. And the other thing we need to understand which connects to that, is what Jesus is quoting. He's not just throwing out words. He's quoting from um, Isaiah chapter 6, when he says that they may see but not perceive, hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. That word lest literally means otherwise. He's saying if they could see, if they could hear, they would turn and be forgiven. But what's he talking about? This uh, chapter in Isaiah chapter 6, which all the Jews would have known, by heart. If I were to start singing the line of a song, you can't get no, or I can't get no, it's faction, right? You, you, so that, that was really poor. Uh, it was off the top of my head. But you reference the rest of the song, and if that's going through your head the rest of the day, I'm sorry. But that's what Jesus, I think, is doing here. He's quoting from the Old Testament scriptures, which all of them would have known, and they would have immediately referenced the context in a way that I don't think we, most of us, can. We just go, well, that's kind of (laughs) rude. He's he's quoting from, by the way, this chapter, which leading up to this quote, portrays this very detailed picture of God's people in persistent rebellion against him. 
He's calling to them. He's inviting them into his, his kingdom, his rule, his influence. I have more for you, and they're pushing him away. In fact, if you look at, at chapter 5, leading up to this statement, you see God's people, it says, adding house to house. The idea there is luxurious living without any thought of God. Addicted to, quote, strong drink, known for injustice, pride, falsehood. It keeps going, and chapter 5 really is this lengthy, dismal portrayal of their rebellion. Pushing God out of their lives, and in this chapter, they're described as the vine. You may have heard that before, Israel, as the vine that God had planted, and he cultivated, and he had uh, pruned, and he'd done everything he could to get fruit. That's literally, by the way, what God says in verse 4 of that chapter. What more was there for me to do for my vineyard that I have not done? That's God saying, I've, I've literally done everything I can to reach you. I have, I've spoken to you. I've sent prophets to you. I've been creative in the way that I've communicated. And I've gotten no response. And finally, this is where we get to Isaiah chapter 6, is where you see him say, you, you don't see. You, your ears are closed. You're not turning to me. And essentially in that moment, God in his goodness lets them. He lets them turn away. He lets them harden their hearts. And so Jesus, when he quotes this, in this after he tells this parable, it's a, it's a clear rebuke to the Jews. It, 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 and if anything, it's almost a sign of judgment because we talked last week from John chapter 1 where it says Jesus came to his own people, but his own people did not receive him. The very people who should have been the most stoked that God had sent a redeemer rejected him and killed him. And Jesus knows that this is going to happen. And so he's actually, he's actually proclaiming judgment on these people who are turning away, who when he tells the parable, they just go, crazy guy. And they walk away. You, you can't hear, you can't see. Otherwise you would turn and you'd be forgiven. So this is, by the way, one of the purposes of the, of the parables, Jesus is not pushing people away. The people have pushed Jesus away until God stops pushing. He says, okay, you can walk away. If you don't want to hear the truth, I'm going to stop telling it to you, at least in plain terms. So simply put, the parables filter out people who don't care. Filters out the people in the crowd that are like, whatever, I got, I got bills to pay. I got things to do. This is silly. But the other side of that coin and the other purpose of the parable is exactly the opposite effect. It's like a um, preview for a movie that you want to see. Anybody go to the theater recently? You don't have to raise your hand. I don't know why I do hand raising. I I just like, I like interaction. I like moving. Move with me. (laughs) Um, But you, you you go to a movie and you hopefully get there on time so you can see the previews, which are always a little entertaining. But it's all of this noise and build up and music and all of that. And then it's quiet between previews. And there's always something really enlightening to me about the noises people make after previews. Like, you can hear some people that are like, you know, like, I wouldn't, you couldn't pay me to go watch that movie. And then there's others where you can just tell people are like, oh, when's that come out? See, that's the second group. That's the second purpose of the parable. They're curious, they're receptive, they want more. They're like, hey, that was, that was great. Is there anything else to it? It's that response to Jesus. Verse 13, let's continue reading. So they've already come and asked him about the parables. He says, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom. And then he says, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The farmer sows the word. So you can see he begins to explain the parable to them, which I love. It's so kind of him. And he right away gives them sort of a key to understanding and interpreting the parable. The seed is the word. It's God speaking. It's God saying, come back to me. Repent. Return. I have better for you than what you're currently experiencing. I know that the culture has said this is as good as it gets. I promise it's not. See, God is sowing seeds constantly. And you can see in this parable that that is literally the constant seeds are sown. What's different, the the variable is the soil the response of the heart. So he continues to explain in verse 15, these are the people along the path. The word is sown, 
And when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown. It's just the honest realization that we have an enemy, a spiritual enemy. We can't see him, but he's real. And he hates for people to experience the color of God's presence and kingdom. Verse 16 goes on, and these are the ones sown on rocky ground. These are people who, when they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy. What you would think quick response is good. But Jesus points out this can be due to a lack of actual depth. There's no foundation underneath there. There's no root. And he says but they have no root in themselves, so they endure for a while. But when tribulation or persecution or difficulty arises, when the sun comes out, immediately they fall away. And you could say that's the not worth it group. And others, in verse 18, are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. So Jesus explains the parable to them, and it hit me this week as I was reading this chapter that this response of the disciples is an immediate application of the parable he just told. Right? Because he had just sown the seed to an entire crowd of people, and there were some people who barely heard what he said, and it was gone. And there were other people who were like, cool, I would ask, but I'm too busy. I've got things to take care of at my house. I've got money to manage or whatever their reason. They left. And then you have this group that that came to Jesus. And it was when they came and said, Jesus, what does this mean that he said this to them? To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. How many of you like secrets? (laughs) I suppose it depends on what the secret is. Um, or how good you are at keeping secrets. Maybe you don't like people telling you secrets. Um, There's something in all of us, I think, that is just a little intrigued. Like, for example, if I said, hey guys, I have a secret to tell you about myself today that I've never told anybody. There's some of you who'd be like, "Uh uh-oh. And maybe others would just be like, whoa, excited. I doubt many people would just sort of be passively whatever. We, we want to hear secrets. I actually hopped on Amazon this week in one of my more distracted moments, and I typed in the secret to, and I hit enter, and I got 200,000 results. We all want to know the secret. We want to know the secret to success, the secret to wealth, the secret to relational happiness, all of that stuff. And so imagine for a moment that you come to Jesus, and you ask him, hey, Jesus, what's... What was I supposed to hear or understand in that story? And he says to you, to you has been given the secret. What would you think? Um, I'd be like, what's the secret? I don't don't have the secret. That's why I'm here. I'm I'm coming to you. I don't know this. But he's like, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. That's kind of what I want to drill into a little with our time this morning and sort of of the focus. And I want to start by pointing out Um, Some translations say mystery, and that is the Greek word. It's translated mystery in many places. Uh, And mystery is something that is either totally out of our grasp, we can't know it, or something that has not yet been revealed. And, And a couple examples of those definitions. On the one hand, if you hear the mysteries of the universe, for me, the implication there is there's just stuff we're not gonna know. Here's stuff we're not going to understand. them. It's a, it's a mystery. And you kind of just put your hands up and go, oh, well. But then there's like the mystery in a, I just referenced movie preview, in like a, a mystery movie or a novel. How many like mystery? And, and the idea in that is not it's unknowable. It's that it's not yet been made known. So, so you're sitting with discomfort. You're sitting with questions and you're going, yeah, but but who did that? And who's the real killer? And why do you know all those questions that come up? And the reason it's a good mystery is because it hasn't yet been revealed. But by the end you go, okay, ideally, hopefully that's how it ends. The reason I share that is the Bible's definition and application of this idea of mystery is is the latter. It's the second. It's, It's we don't know it because God hasn't yet made it known to us. And you see that in so many ways in the Bible. And in fact, we don't really know anything that God hasn't revealed to us. He created us, gave us eyes and ears and senses with which we could assimilate information. 
Um, but the Bible says that creation itself is God's revelation of his presence and his glory. And that's why the Bible says they are without excuse when people say, oh, nope, there's no God. He's like, I've made it obvious. I've already revealed that to people. That's not, it shouldn't even be a question. It also says that the Bible is the revelation of God's will. And the book of Ephesians refers to this as the mystery of his will centered around the person of Jesus. Which is a really important thing to note that at this time when Jesus was on the earth, many things that were mysterious were becoming made, were, were becoming clear. So many mysteries that revolved around the person of Jesus. And I wanted to bullet point a few of these. Some of you may recognize them. First Timothy chapter 3 refers to the mystery of godliness which revolves around Christ. Uh, Ephesians 5 talks about the mystery of marriage, not just the fact that you can't understand your spouse. That is one. Um, I'm kidding. Uh, the mystery of marriage is that it's not just about two people entering into some social contract. It is about Christ and his love for the church. Marriage, by God's design, since he created it, is to show the world that there's a God who loves people. That's a mystery. I, I would not have thought that on my own. Colossians chapter 1 talks about the, uh, the mystery of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now, would you admit that it's a mystery that Jesus lives in me and you? That's not something I would have as a human said, let's have it be that way. God will live in me. But that is the mystery, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And then Ephesians 3 is another that refers to the mystery of the gospel, especially for these Jews, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and children of God. Everyone's invited. That would have, that would have been a mind-boggling mystery to the Jews. So there are many mysteries, things that were being revealed at this time. And just to pique your interest, there are things that have yet to be revealed to us. An example of this is 1 John chapter 3 where it says Christ will return and when he comes back, we will be like him. But what does that mean? What does it mean I will be like Jesus in, in, in form, in function? John admits when he says, beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet been revealed. I love it when, when the writers of the Bible are just really honest. We don't know. I don't know what it means that I'll be like Jesus, but I know it's going to be cool. Um, so the point is there's so many of these examples in the Bible, such mysteries that God reveals to us, but I want to bring back to this specific chapter where Jesus says to his disciples when they come to him and this group of people that says, hey, tell us more about that parable. When he says to you has been given the secret. He's not talking about the, 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 the mystery of marriage. Christ and the church, which hadn't even, the church hadn't, didn't exist at this point. He's not talking about the mystery of the gospel that the Gentiles were included, which hadn't happened at this point. He says the secret of the what? The kingdom. And what's the kingdom? The kingdom is God's rule and reign and influence in my life. What is the secret to experiencing more of his change, of his color, of his life that he made me for? What's the mystery? What's the secret? I think that's what Jesus is getting at. And when he says, you have the secret, what is that? Well, I just studied and sat with this for a while this week. One option that I read in a book is, is the parables. The parables are sort of the secret, the mystery. That's, that's it right there. But right here in verse 11, Jesus says, to you has been given the secret. For those outside, everything is in parables. So it's like, nope, that can't be it because the parables are for everybody. Everyone hears the parables. That's not the secret. And then I was like, okay, so it's maybe the ability to interpret the parables. Wouldn't that make sense? To you has been given the secret. And you come to Jesus and you're like, Jesus, I know what the, I know what the seed is. It's the word. But is that what we see here? No, they, they don't know what's going on. They, they have to ask him. And in fact, Jesus says, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all of the parables? Further down in the chapter, it says he did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Why did he have to explain everything? They didn't know what it meant. So the secret of the kingdom is not I have some special ability that others don't have to know what Jesus means. And then I was like, well, maybe the secret of the kingdom is they know who Jesus is. It's the identity of Jesus. He's the Christ. 
But then I kept reading through this, ex- this very same chapter. At the end, there's a storm on the lake and they're out on the lake and the disciples are freaking out. And verse 41 says, they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey? Now it is true that later on in, in the ministry, um, Peter declares, you're the Christ. And in that moment, Jesus says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. There's another moment of revelation for them, but it wasn't at this point. So what is the secret? I want to acknowledge Jesus could mean, he could mean, you're on the right track. You're going to understand all of these mysteries that have been, you know, previously unknown by the prophets and all of that stuff. But I really think in the context of what's taking place, I, I'm forced to ask, what is it that separates the group of disciples from the rest of the crowd? How are they different? Is it in their ability to intuitively know what Jesus was talking about? No. Their knowledge of Jesus' identity? No. It's that they came to Jesus. They understood that the kingdom of God is not a destination or a transaction whereby I avoid hell and get heaven. They understood that he's the kingdom. He's the manifestation of the presence of God and the glory of God. And to the extent that I'm near him and I'm moving nearer to him, I have more color. That's what I think they're saying. It's a journey of discovery. The key is paying attention to Jesus. You say that with me? The key is paying attention to Jesus. I'm not making that up. That's exactly what Jesus says right after the parable. In verse 23, he says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. That's a common refrain for Jesus. There's going to be people who don't hear and people who do. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. These verses have always bugged me. just going to be honest. Uh, Because it feels like just a series of, of incomplete sentences. You know, like yesterday I went to... This afternoon I'm going to run down the hill and grab a... What? You know, so like, Jesus, the one who has, more will be given. Has what? More what? (laughs) Well, I have to go back to the beginning of his statement. He begins by saying, pay attention. There's the object. Pay attention. And then there's the series of financial statements. If you financial people, pay. Pay attention. And he says then, the measure you use will be measured to you. And, and, and the one who has, more will be given. The one who doesn't, what he has will be taken away. So what Jesus is saying, I think, is the measure of attention you pay will be paid to you. Because if I were to say, uh, pay money and the measure you use will be measured to you, what am I talking about? I'm talking about money. So when he says, pay attention, give attention. How many of you have unlimited attention? Tell me your secret. We all have limited attention. Pay attention and more attention will be paid to you. I'm like, is that biblical? And then I, and then I remembered this verse that you may recognize from the Old Testament. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Now, What this means isn't that God is ignoring certain people or as we might have concluded from Jesus' response, he's he's, he's trying to exclude. But what it absolutely means is that attention is paid to those who pay attention to him. And you can find that in various places. Uh, um, Hebrews 11, 6, faith, uh, faith is believing that God exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You know, I think as Christians, we're good with the first part of that definition. God exists. Yes, I believe that. You know, are we good believing that if we seek God, he'll reward us? That's part of faith. Attention is paid to those who pay attention to him. When you invest, you get back. That's what he says. The measure you use will be measured to you. 
And what this practically means related to the kingdom of God is God is not going to force himself into your reality. Now, when it comes to salvation, I would say, thank God that he forced himself into my reality. Thank God that he pursued me when I was not pursuing him. But when it comes to the experience of color and vibrance and joy, the practical stuff of life, he's not just going to download it. For whatever reason, God has chosen to work in the style of parable. He puts out an invitation, maybe. And some people are like, no, I, I don't know. I don't notice. I don't care. I'm too busy for that. Others, though, Pay attention. They ask questions. They say, I want to know more. This life and the life that is being offered to me by this world or my culture or whatever isn't fulfilling me. God, what else is there? The eyes of the Lord search throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. I wanted to share a story that you may recognize. Moses is a man in the Old Testament. Um, And if you don't know, he is the one that God called and and, and empowered to lead his people out of 400 years of being enslaved in Egypt. And before all of that happened, though, Moses was just minding his own business, doing a job, uh, taking care of sheep. And one day he's walking along and he looks and he notices a bush that's on fire, but it's not burning up. And in that moment, he has a choice. I just kind of pretend that I ate some bad pizza and I keep going or what? Chapter 3, verse 3 of Exodus. Again, all of these places, I'd encourage you to go read them later. Study them out. It's cool. It'd be a cool application of the sermon. Keep going. Uh, but anyway, verse 3, Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. So I want you to notice for a second, Moses had things to do. How many of you have things to do? I mean, you have jobs. You have a to-do list. You've got that thing done. Now I've got to get that thing done. Who's driven like that? That's totally me. Um, Moses, for a moment, set that aside. Right? The sheep will be fine or not. But I'm going to go turn aside and see why this bush is not burned. In verse 4, look at what it says. When the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to see, God called to him. Out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Now, When I sit with this, I ask myself, why wouldn't God just skip the bush? Why wouldn't he just say, Moses? And Moses is on doing the sheep, and he's like, oh, yeah, well, there's God. I think it was a parable. And I don't know, I don't want to dig too deep into it. Maybe the parable was a man God was intending to set on fire. I don't know. Maybe it meant nothing. But either way, God was assessing Moses' level of spiritual appetite. He was throwing out a, a, a bid. I think that's, that's relational language. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you're as interested in me as I am in you. God is trying to see if Moses is willing to turn aside from the daily routine and go investigate. And when he does, that's when God spoke. Not until then. And presumably if Moses had just walked past, he never would have heard God speak. Friends, there are so many things vying for your attention. Would you agree? And many of them are great things, important things. But God specifically reveals himself to those who are willing to turn aside. To to, to come over, to follow up, to say, hey, I've got some questions here. He's always throwing seeds. That's the constant. He's always inviting. He's always uh, sending invitations. Maybe it's the sermon. Maybe it's a conversation you have later. Maybe it's the sunset or something. And you don't just say, wow, cool, isn't science awesome? You say, God, I want to know you. He's always sowing seeds. He's searching, as we just read, through the whole earth for those whose hearts are fully committed to him. To pay attention to them, to give direction, to give insight and joy where we lack it. And so I don't know where you are on this spectrum of disinterested. Maybe you're interested, but you're distracted. Maybe you're, you're curious and you're like, I think I could take a step. Maybe you're committed. I don't know where you are on that, but the benefits of taking this seriously, um, I wanted to just share with you. Solomon in Proverbs 2 is speaking to, it says, my son, I think he is, 
by extension, speaking to young men who he knows what it's like to be young. And he's like, guys, listen, I know that the world is going to tell you so many things, but listen, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, if you are attentive to wisdom, that's the ability to live rightly and incline your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, do you hear the progressively increasing engagement for, of, of your whole person? I can just show up and sit. That's one way. I can sit and listen. I could write something down, but are we willing to engage our hearts, raise our voices? He says, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. The fear of the Lord, by the way, is another mystery that to those outside may say, well, I don't want to be afraid. Come near to God and listen and you'll understand what that means. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. I love how the, the destination of this journey is not knowledge, it's the Lord. The Lord gives wisdom from his mouth. You're going to hear God say your name. Friends, this is the aim of our search, which is why in, in the book of Hebrews it says to fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the author of your faith. He's the one who starts the good work and he's the one who promises to complete the work he's begun. He's the secret. And, and, and the mystery of, of, the, of life in the kingdom is that I've arrived, but I'm also still moving. It's that I have him, but I want him. The way A.W. Tozer puts it in his book, The Pursuit of God, he says, to have found God and still to pursue him is the soul's paradox of love. Scorned indeed by the too easily satisfied religionists, but justified in happy experience by the children of the of the, by the children of the burning heart. There's two groups, and I wouldn't say I live 100% of the time in one or the other, but there's the response of I'm here to check the box, uh, the kingdom's a destination, I'm good, I've got my God, and now I can go back and live my life. And then there's those who are just hungry and they're curious and they know they need Jesus and they know they're not enough without him and they know he has more color for them to experience. And A.W. Tozer's description is children of the burning heart. See, I think that's what kept those disciples from just going back and continuing on with their day. There was something going on. God was moving. So the secret of the kingdom, the secret to experiencing more color, more saturation more influence. It's Jesus. It's coming to Jesus. It's being honest with Jesus. It's staying with Jesus, no matter how hard it is. It's not being satisfied with a sermon or a Sunday. It's coming like the disciples with our frustrations and our questions and our challenges and waiting long enough to hear a response, perhaps. And as we close, there's really not a better picture of this than little children. And I had to include this because there's so many times Jesus talks about little children. It's almost always in a conversation about the kingdom of God. And I, I don't know what your experience is, but, experience is, but my kids have no problem coming to me. Um, I've got six kids. We have six kids, my wife and I. Um, they have no problem coming to me and asking me for things, asking me to do things, asking me questions. And I will say it's usually at bedtime. <laughs> They're not dumb. Um, Dad, what's the meaning of life, you know? <laughs> we'll talk about that tomorrow, buddy. Love you, you know. But what's wonderful is, is how many times Jesus references little children and how he responds to little children. One of these instances, very quickly, Mark chapter 10, if you were to turn five or six pages, you'd end up there. Mark chapter 10. Um, people are bringing their kids to Jesus and the disciples try to stop them. So there's sort of this like, you know, powerful leader, earthly mentality of like little kids are a waste of Jesus' time, which I think maybe we've all felt that way at times. Jesus, it says, when he saw it, he was indignant. He was angry. And he said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Kids, you hear that? 
To such belongs the kingdom of God. And truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom like a child shall not enter it. That's pretty bold. Now again, what is the kingdom of God? What do we receive? We're not receiving a plot of land or a geographical location. We're receiving Jesus. We're receiving God himself and his influence. And if you're not willing to just come and say, what do you have for me, God? You're not going to make it. He's saying, let them come to me. And in fact, you better be coming too. Unless you're like a little child. And this incident, by the way, stands in stark contrast to the one that follows. A man comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's asking the question Jesus just answered. (laughs) How do I get into the kingdom, Jesus? And Jesus shares the commandments with this man, which is the language he speaks. Jesus is talking in a language that he knows. And the man says, I've kept all these since my youth. And then verse 21, Jesus, looking at him, loved him, which is so profound, and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away, sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You see the contrast? Little kids, come to Jesus. Jesus, hey, are we going to go on an adventure today? I have one specific kid that says, Dad, can we go on an adventure? And what that constitutes is we wander around the field for an hour. <laughs> and, he, and he loves it. And he always comes back with, you know, Dad, look at that. I mean, he's so curious. And i got to become like a little child to, to go. Children are, are unencumbered in this man. You know, I, I don't think that this is a parable about, or a story about money. Money is bad, things are bad. I think it's about being distracted. I think it's about being freed up to come to Jesus like a little child. And, and it's right after this that Jesus says to the disciples how hard it is for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not because they have money, but because they're distracted. And, you know, maybe we're, you're thinking of Bill Gates. <laughs> I think it's safe to say we are all rich. We all have so much more than the rest of the world. And and if you can't relate to the the part of the parable about the the thorns, tell me your secret. Because that's where Jesus says, those who hear the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things chokes the word. Friends, the message for me, for you, for all of us, is to pay attention to Jesus. It's to honestly evaluate and ask, where are you spending your attention? And are are we, am I, are you expecting something out of your relationship with God that you are not willing to first invest? I think that's where Jesus is at. I think that's what he's saying. A call to pay attention. I want to be very clear. This has nothing to do with earning his affection or or earning salvation it's about priorities how much do i want that color in my life so as our worship team comes to close us i wanted to offer a couple questions i love jesus willingness to leave us hanging he does it constantly and i think that in our modern approach to theology and church we are much better at wrapping things up than jesus was Um, Jesus was very comfortable telling a story, letting some people walk away, letting other people follow him and have a conversation. And so that's what I want to encourage is just, you're in, you're in process. I'm in process. There's no destination. We're all moving forward. And so here's some questions to help with that. The first is super simple and basic. Is there anything in your life that you don't understand? And I would add, is confusing, is frustrating, is perplexing, whatever your word is. And you may chuckle and think, is there anything that's not, you know, um, anything that I do understand? But it's, 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 again, like a little child being willing to go, yeah, oh yeah, I've got some things. I, I, could, I could come to Jesus, right? It's like setting the cynic aside for a second that we learn as we get older and I'm guilty of being like, whatever. Set that aside and just be like, what what is confusing to me? And then the second question is, what are you doing with those? What are you doing with those questions and frustrations and uncertainties? Are you, I don't say this lightly, are are you numbing them with a substance, with entertainment, 
we're all guilty of, of something. Jesus is not against us and judging us and that he's for us. He wants to call us back to himself. But I think it's hard to sit with those things and to sit with them in the presence of Jesus. But that's what these disciples did. They came to him. They listened to him. They stayed with him. And so maybe that's you finding some time this afternoon or this week a practical way where you can really be honest with God. I'm angry. God, this life has not brought what I thought it would and what I hoped it would. Start there. Start with real. And maybe it is a day away that is required. Maybe it's starting to read a chapter of the Bible a day, not to get through a chapter, but to be present to Jesus to listen to him. The secret of the kingdom is a willingness to come to Jesus, to stay with him, to keep coming, and allow him to change us from the inside out. Pray with me, would you? Thank you, Lord, for your patience with us. In the pace of our lives and the busyness, I think sometimes it's hard to picture Jesus um, looking at a man and loving him. With, with the space in his calendar and the space in his heart to just look at a man and love him. Or, or, or to say, let all the little kids come to me. Go get more. Jesus, we need that in this culture, in this time where we're so busy, we're so scheduled. Jesus, help us. We only have so much attention and we are struggling to pay it in the right directions. Would you help us, Lord Jesus, by your spirit? Even right now in this time, for those here in this room, um, those watching online, speak to us as you spoke to Moses, Lord. We're turning aside. We're saying, God, lead me. We thank you for your presence with us in your name. Amen.